Finally, our speaker uh, for this afternoon is Richard Carlton, who is the director of the Lawyer Assistance Program of the State Bar of California. He is also a consultant to the U.S. Courts for the Ninth Circuit, the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judges, and to the Idaho Judicial Branch on matters of judicial stress and wellness. Mr. Carlton regularly delivers continuing legal education presentations to local bar associations, specialty bars, state bar sections, and law firms throughout California on addressing substance abuse and managing stress. His articles have appeared in Judicature, the Judges Journal of the ADA, California Bar Journal, and other legal publications. He has been addressing mental health and disability concerns in the legal profession for 25 years. Richard holds a master's degree in public health from UC Berkeley, where his studies focused on treatment interventions and behavioral science research. Please welcome Richard Carlton. Nice to be with you all this afternoon. Although, give the confidence guy a job of keeping people awake at 4 o'clock. <laughs> right. right, right, okay. I think I'm up to the challenge. Um, so we're going to do things a little differently, speaking of which. Um, if you would please, I'd like you to all rise. Get that blood flowing for a moment. So, we're going to do a little, a little question and answer. Those of you who believe that, or would say that, the reason why the legal profession has unusually high rates of anxiety and depression and, and substance abuse is primarily a consequence of the stress of practicing law. I'd like you folks to go ahead and take a seat. I've never done it this way. Or what? That's a good question. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Somebody who's still standing. Would you like to venture an explanation other than stress? Anybody? Yes, sir. The effect of practicing law on the rest of your life. For your family and that sort of thing. Okay, all right. That's good. That's another factor. Yes, sir. Type A personality. Type A personality, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you folks can also be on that. Thank you. Yeah. Does it attract more people who are susceptible? I think that's, that's an excellent question. Um, because, let's see. Let's sit down, but no, let's try this one. There we go. Um, it is considered a high-risk profession. Um, most scientists who study brain chemistry issues, and that's, that's basically what we're talking about when we're addressing these kinds of competence issues, because the kind of competence issues that I'm talking about this afternoon are the ones that have to do with how our physical being uh, and what we experience physically and mentally and emotionally have an impact on, on our ability to confidently practice. Scientists will tell you that uh, whether or not someone experiences problems uh, in their adult life of this nature, of these brain, brain chemistry issues, is really pretty much a 50 50 equation. That is to say, it's about 50% based on our life experiences, the compilation of our experiences in our adult life. But the other 50% is based on the particular chemistry we're born with. Some of us inherit a particular brain chemistry that makes us more susceptible to experiencing problems like anxiety, depression, and other mood disorders, and substance use problems. So it's really pretty much a 50-50 equation. That being the case, um, to me that suggests that you cannot simply, uh, you can't, that's what I'm looking for, you, 
you can't uh, assert, if you will, that all of the magnitude of the problems encountered by the legal profession per se, as compared to other pr professions, is simply a result of the experience of practicing alone. But it suggests to me that for some reason, more people who are susceptible to experiencing these problems are also attracted to this practice for reasons that we don't entirely know. Or maybe we do. Maybe those of you in the room have, have an idea better than I do. Uh, so I thought I'd spend a, just a little bit of time, therefore, taking a look at, you know, what, what are the particular types of personalities? And Jill in the back of the room said something about type A personalities. What are the particular constellation of personalities and characteristics that seem to be more often attracted to this practice than other? So there's one person that I know of, and we do, we do know that with, with regard to depression, certain personalities do appear to be overrepresented in the population of adults that experience these problems than other personalities. So there does appear to be a link there. So what are the traits, what would you say are the traits that are more common in this particular population as, a, as compared to the general adult population? Let's say. Competitive. competitive. Concerned with minutiae. Concerned with the minutiae. Yeah. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've never heard that exact <laughs> phrase, but I like it. Okay, I'm going to remember that one. I get it. What else? Perfectionism. Perfectionism? Yeah. Okay. Another way of saying minutiae. Another way of saying minutiae. Concerned with minutiae. Okay. Sorry? I don't know how you express it, but the need to be right or correct. The need to be right or correct. Okay, sure. Uh, degree of control over externalities. Okay, the need to exercise control. Yes, ma'am? Caring. Caring. That's a nice one. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 I agree. <laughs> yes, sir? Yes, yeah, sure. sir. Thank you. 
between the particular personality characteristics of the individuals coming into that setting and the, the experience of being in that setting and the impact that had on those individuals. <clears throat> oh, I just thought I'd throw this out. This is a, a recent survey done on uh, law students called the Survey of Law Student Wellbeing, although I would posit that it's probably mislabeled. <laughs> Um, not, you know, I mean, it wasn't a, what we call a representative sample, but it was a pretty large sample size, 34, roughly 3,400 students from around the country responded. And amazingly to me, even somebody who's been working in the profession for almost 30 years, 18% of those respondents would have screened positive for depression, and 6% had thought seriously about hurting themselves in the past 12 months. That's pretty scary stuff. So she says that what we're doing is we're taking individuals with a certain predisposition and we're turning out competitive, argumentative, and aggressive, low interest in emotions and feelings, a higher incidence of distress and substance abuse, and a pessimistic outlook on life. Big surprise to anybody? Um, Oh, I'm sorry? How long were they, had they become lawyers before all of this? Oh, no, no, this is, this is just law school. <laughs> just, just based on, uh, you know. Does it get worse? <laughs> Some studies have suggested that, you know, we have a lot more data, fortunate or unfortunate, we have a lot more data about law students because they're captive audience. You know, the professor walks in the room and says, you're going to, you know, complete this instrument, you know, this questionnaire now. Nobody's going to refuse. It's a lot harder to capture data. There is a, a study, a very large, with a very large sample size, uh, just now being run by uh, a team of folks from Hazleton and, and ABA of looking at these kind of issues in practicing attorneys. Um, which is, you know, somewhat instructive. Again, you know, it's it's not, you know, it's, it, there's a caveat. It's not a representative sample. I wish somebody would actually pay to do that. There's a way to do that. You know, the survey, those giant survey firms like Gallup out there, they know how to get this kind of data. You only have to sample, you know, a few hundred people, and scientifically, you can produce representative results. Uh, but it's expensive. Because you have to, you know, you have to reach out to thousands and thousands of, of people selected, you know, attorneys selected at random from around the country. In any way, um, no way to pay to do that yet. So, um, so, yes, sir. What, uh, what university did, did they include, or did they, did they segregate the different universities to different results? Oh, uh, you mean the uh, the well-being study? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, that, that's a good question. I don't. I don't know. I don't have that. They probably did separate it out, and you know, I'm sure that there were differences from from one school to another. Yeah. We go directly to, uh, from college to law school. Right. Want to come back and do sure. later if you didn't want to cooperate with from you know, no more And there's a very and, and, and from what I've experienced going into law schools, there is a fairly profound difference in the atmosphere and climate. And how maybe nurturing is made too strong a word, but the degree of concern for these kind of human care, you know, issues uh, by the school versus others for whom you know it's very different. Anyway, um, so I'm sure it would be very different from school to school. But anyway, I, I did a palisades in old that last one because uh, Dr. Martin Selig is another psychologist. He's University of Pennsylvania. He's kind of built his academic career on studying our own, how our natural pessimism versus optimism affects our experience of life in a number of ways. He decided he would study the Virginia School of Law 1990 class. What he discovered when he did that was that the most pessimistic of all the students in that class outperformed the more optimistic students on all standard measures of law school performance. Yes. Um, you know, somebody's fist pumping back there, yes, go pessimism, right? <laughs> he said, in fact, 
the level of pessimism that was found in that, that particular group of the most successful students in, in that class was greater than what you would typically find in a room full of clinically depressed individuals. <laughs> And what made it even more insidious is that it was really the, the, the most insidious form of pessimism. That is, it was stable, bad things happen to happen, and frequently global, you know, they, they affect my entire life, and worst of all, it was internalized. So bad things happen, you know, that you, you know, locus of control from your undergraduate psychology, bad things happen, you know, not because of factors outside of my control, but because of me because I'm not good enough or I don't do a good enough job or prepare well enough. Any of this sound familiar? No. No? Okay, good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, this, so what we're basically saying here is, is so we, we have a group of individuals who may be attracted to this particular professional work because of certain characteristics and personalities that may also be for some reason linked to the greater propensity for having problems like anxiety and depression and so forth. And then we put them into an environment where what? Where their natural negative propensity is encouraged. I mean, what's law school about? It certainly doesn't teach you to look at the world through rose-colored glasses. You know, what, what, is, what is the focus? It's on problems. Right? It's either about solving problems or even better, anticipating them ahead of time. We, you know, you know, and that's, the, you know, that's the real challenge. Anyway, so all of this has led yet another law professor, Lawrence Krieger, who is very involved in studying these issues. He says that thinking like a lawyer is a legal skill, not necessarily a life skill. He says your skills as a lawyer are useful in certain professional contexts but need not and should not dictate how you approach your personal life or assume your entire identity. And certainly there are places where those particular skills and that particular way of looking at the world, approaching the world, is more beneficial than not. In other places where it's not quite as beneficial as what I'm trying to say. Um, well, how many people in the room are married to another lawyer? Yeah, I, I see a lot of that in my audience. So, yet another psychologist, Fiona Travis, wrote a, a nice little book called Should You Marry a Lawyer? Because she was married to one and she figured she had particular expertise and she needed to impart to other people when they were trying to decide whether to do that or not. And uh, so what she does is she shows in there on a page, I don't, I don't have a slide up here, but just to quickly summarize, she shows the characteristics on one side that are necessary ineffective in approaching a legal problem or issue. And on the other side, those characteristics and ways of approaching another human being to build lasting, strong, bonded, emotional relationships, and how often those two are, you know, whoops, <laughs> diametrically opposed. So, you know, again, basically the point being that where you choose to apply that particular training and skill in your life experience, and where you don't, uh, which merits some thought and consideration or, or mindfulness, if you will. So let's um, let's talk about this in a little broader terms for a moment. What would you say are the things that uh, cause you to experience the most stress? Anybody? Time demands. Time demands. Okay, thank you. Clients who don't pay. Yeah, clients who don't pay. Okay. You know, that's a big change. When I started asking this question in the early 90s, I didn't hear that as often. Uh, what else? Yes, sir. Fear of making a mistake. Fear of making a mistake. Yes. Unreasonable expectations. Ooh, I love that one. Unreasonable expectations. Yes. Yes, ma'am. You're feeling responsible for what happens to somebody. Like you're anxious because this person doesn't get the results. Feeling responsible for somebody else's. <laughs> and is that a fusion, Wiles? Did I get that right? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Close enough. Hoping. Uh, combative opposing counsel. Combative opposing counsel. Yes. 
Okay. Yes, ma'am. Unreasonable judges. Unreasonable judges, right. Okay. Unreasonable everybody. Um, let me ask the questions in a slightly different way. Would you say that these are the factors that determine how much stress you personally experience on a day-to-day -day basis or not? I see people shaking their heads yes. Anybody say no? Yes, sir. It's your attitude towards them. Your attitude towards them. Yeah. Or, or another way of, of looking at it, it's, it's how you respond or react to things that you have to contend with. Yeah, whoops. Well, there's that little simple little message there. You know, I really don't know why I put that slide there, other than just hoping maybe if I flashed it up on the screen enough times, you'd get the message that there's somebody there to help. Um, yeah. So it's, you can't, in order to have the nervous system response reaction that we call stress, uh, you have to have some inter, intervening factor between the situation or circumstance that you're facing, approaching, the stress war, if you will, and your nervous system reaction. And that intervening factor is how you interpret or perceive what it is that you are contending with. How, how you, your brain, your mind, your body, you know, responds and reacts to it. It's, it's not just automatic. And, although we sometimes, I think, fall into the trap of, of thinking that all of us respond and react to every given situation or circumstance in a like fashion. The reality is very much, um, that is very much not the case. The reality is very far from that. And social psychologists have studied this. What they've done is they've, you know, wired people up to instruments in a room like this, and then they expose everybody in the room to some kind of contrived, stressful situation that they have to deal with. Like, I don't know, the fire alarm going off or something like that. And you know, they measure how everybody in that population of subjects responds. And of course, what you end up with if you have a large enough population is you get this natural, the natural bell shaped curve distribution, meaning that um, that's just the way we are. Um, so, this is by no means uh, a new thought in Hamlet, Shakespeare wrote. That things are neither good nor bad. Tis thinking that makes it so. The point, so maybe Shakespeare was an early existential thinker, perhaps. <laughs> you know, the, the point being that nothing can be negative, bad, evil, terrible, stressful, whatever label you want to use, without our mind interpreting it and imputing that characteristic on it in some fashion. And, you know, we, of course, today in our society have very different factors and circumstances and situations that we define in such a fashion that produces that kind of stress than our ancestors did a thousand years ago. Why do we even have a stress response in our bodies? Survival. Survival, exactly. So just about every life form on the planet has in their the nervous system something designed to keep that that species alive, some mechanism similar to our stress response, and it's all about survival. So, but it, what we're supposed to be reacting to, therefore, is something that, that literally threatens the continuation of, of us as a species. And interestingly. We today are really primed to respond to certain situations in, in a certain way uh, because we have very highly defined and developed stress response systems in us through thousands of years of evolution. What I'm saying is that we are here today us, those of us in this room, because our ancestors who did face many cases, circumstances, and situations throughout their adult life that literally did have the potential to threaten their survival on a day-to-day -day basis, we fortunately don't, except for, you know, unusual circumstances like if you happen to be in Paris at the wrong place at the wrong time, 
sadly to say. Um, but, you know, there was a time a thousand years ago where this kind of threat from the outside was to actual survival was very common. So the people who managed to scan the horizon regularly for the next impending catastrophe were the ones who survived. And because of all our ancestors at least survived to the point of procreation by being so good at that, we're here today. Otherwise, we wouldn't be, right? So we have developed in us this highly refined ability to, again, scan the horizon for the next impending catastrophe. Well, who does that better than legal professionals? So I would posit that you are the best of the best at doing that. So, anyway, here's, here's just a you know, that the diagram showing how the nervous system stress response works in the nervous system, um, which, you know, you, you, all of us understand how that works today. We'll later the point. But there is something that I believe makes us, again, unique. As I said, most life forms have something in them similar to this to keep them alive. But we have this capacity in us that makes us unique, I believe, from, if not all of the life forms of the planet, certainly the vast majority of them. And it is this. So here's my example. So um, my daughter's cat, Zeus, is asleep here on the table, right? If I walk up behind him and clap my hands loud, what does he do? He's going to jump. Right? Right? And frankly, so would we if we were sound asleep and somebody stuck up behind us and clapped loudly. What makes us different, though, from Zeus? He gets over it more quickly. Well, he does get over it more quickly, that's true. Fortunately, otherwise our pets wouldn't like, stick around very long. They're very forgiving. That's one. There is, there's another difference. I don't think that he has the capacity to lie there worrying about whether I'm going to snake up behind him tomorrow and clap my hands loudly. But we do that, right? Constantly. So this is why I say that to me, when it comes to managing the stress of, 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 of being a, a legal professional, or frankly, any kind of role for the adult day. Managing your stress is really about managing your mind. Your mind is basically your own worst enemy. Because of that tendency and that inclination to go as it does to wherever that most scary and threatening place is, there are that, those deep, dark recesses. So I like to say, it's dark and scary, don't go too far in there. But, of course, um, or as Mark Twain put it, I've known many troubles in my life, most of which didn't happen. Um, you know, why, why is this a particular challenge for legal professionals in particular? Well, what are you? <coughs> Your cats, no, <laughs> maybe paid warriors, paid warriors, and paid warriors. Both, right? I mean, basically, somebody else is paying you either to anticipate and try to prevent and avoid their problems for them, or alternatively to resolve them after they've already occurred. So that, that's basically what you're paid to do. So, in essence, a way of thinking about it is you're being paid by somebody to stress out on their behalf. Because <laughs> that's basically, you know, that's basically what's happening. When we, when we worry, we're basically activating the stress response. Maybe not to the same intensity as if the situation were happening right at this moment, but we have, most of us, you know, an amazing capacity to conjure up the worst case scenario or situation. And, and experience the consequences of that without it ever happening. As Mark Twain says, I know many troubles in my life, most of which didn't happen because all of us kind of go through this. So I certainly 
cannot, would not, as a representative of your organized farm, stand up here and tell you that you shouldn't do what you're getting paid to do, right? I do, however, think that I am safe, uh, even in my capacity, to say to you that I don't believe you should be doing it when you're not going to be paid for it. And unfortunately, I think far too many of us um, have way too much the tendency and inclination to do that. Now, um, I realize that not everybody agrees with me. I made this statement many years in a room full of deputy district attorneys in the county that shall go unnamed. Um, and in the middle of this talk, a you know, young man stood up and he said, I object to what you're saying. <laughs> That was the first and only time that's ever happened. But I said, okay. Um, he said, because I believe my employer is paying me to worry about these problems 24-7. I hope you got a different job. I don't think any of us are paid enough to do that. I don't think any of us can survive very long if we do that. So, what's it about? Well, you know, it, well, this is getting back to what I was saying a while ago. Um, so, the, you know, I, you know, I throw out all these psychologists, then I get another neuropsychologist, Rick Hansen. He, he has a book where he talks about the fact that we today have this built-in negativity bias, as I was saying before, because of the fact that we have evolved from people who had to respond and react to actual fr frequent Danger. He says we routinely overestimate that threats and underestimate opportunities. We launch on to the, the bad things. And unfortunately, he said we're like Teflon for negative for positive experiences. They just kind of roll off of us. But all those negative ones and all the negative ones that we're worried about, those are the ones that stick. Velcro for negative experiences and Teflon for positive ones. Well, What's the anecdote? It's, it's this moment, right? Yeah, the reverse of fretting about what's going to come down the pike is, is this very moment. You just think about it, if you stop and think about it, how often are the things that you worry about and concerned about and feel threatened by are happening in this moment. Rarely ever. I would posit that you know, 99 point whatever percent of our time, there is no threat in the present moment. There's no stress in the present moment. Anyway, it's all a consequence of whatever it is that we are Wherever that's going on in those deep, dark, ugly recesses in our minds that we constantly, you know, go back to over and over again, just by, by habit, you know, nothing else, you know, just that sort of constant chatter that we have inside us that wants to just go back to wherever, wherever the most challenging circumstance or event it is that's coming up, that's where our brains are going to go to over and over again by, by the virtue of our nature. So, one time in my life I was, I was named in a personnel action and uh, I, I remember quite clearly driving in the car um, to the deposition of the plaintiffs and the whole two-thirds of the way down in that drive what was going through my head? Anybody want to guess? What are they going to say? Well, what are, yeah, what are they going to say about us? But also, even worse than that, what questions is their counsel going to ask us in our deposition? And, and worrying about trying to think, you know, imagine what that might be and how to prepare for or anticipate. And I actually, I remember stopping the car and pulling over and literally saying to myself, uh -huh. You have to stop thinking about that. It wasn't even scheduled for three weeks. And I realized that I could not spend the next three weeks wondering about and worrying about what that might 
B. Well, of course, what happened? It settled. <laughs> Before you even, the one time I had to be, a, you know, an opportunity to be opposed, didn't happen. So, the power of no, no, the power of this moment. Um, so, there we go. That's why, because there is no stress in the present moment, in this moment. That is why the, the concept of mindfulness is becoming. So, you know, stress was the buzzword in the 70s. Uh, mindfulness is now the buzzword of the, what do we call all these years? The aughts. We are not the aughts, the, the teens. <laughs> I guess we're in the teens. We're not aughts anymore. We're not aughts, right. We're in the teens. So it's, it's, it's the new terminology in our society, the new popular terminology. Well, this is the reason why it is so popular. It is because to the extent that we can keep our attention focused on what is happening in this moment, we don't experience stress. Right? If you sit down and close your eyes for 15 or 20 minutes and focus your attention on your breathing, or however, you know, all sorts of different ways that people choose to, you know, to, to practice mindfulness, what happens? Well, yeah, a lot of us go to sleep. That's okay. But let's just say you stay awake. What happens at the end of that 15 minutes? Well, what happens is, because your brain has stopped thinking about all those problems that you've been fretting about up until that moment, your body basically calms down into a very profound sense of relaxation. Because the thing that keeps us from being relaxed, if we're not using you know, chemicals to get there, the thing that keeps us from getting relaxed and being able to relax is us. It's our own brain. So to the extent that we learn how to discipline and control our tendency to do that and go there, we will experience less stress. Believe me, it works. It's not that easy. I don't stand up here and talk about the easy stuff. There is, there is no easy, in my opinion, shortcut to managing the stress of, of doing this kind of work. The biggest challenge is managing your own mind's reaction to the stuff that you have to deal with. And that, frankly, requires a certain amount of mental discipline. And I would say that, you know, most of the people that I've talked to who have been practicing, you know, comfortably for 30, 40 years, or whatever, you know, they may not have ever practiced a mindfulness practice per se. They've just developed the ability, the inherent ability to do that over time as a survival mechanism to get through it year in and year out. The guy came up to me afterwards, uh, after my talks, and he said he, he really got this message that he, he, he had to do something like this. Uh, he could no longer, discover he could no longer afford to bring the stuff he was dealing with during the work day home with him to his home environment. I don't remember the reason, but he said that I, I had to learn to shut it off. And he said, it didn't happen instantly, but, but over you know, a matter of months, I taught myself that I would fret about whatever was going on in the office as I drove home. And as I approached the front door of the house, I would just kind of mentally dump all that stuff on a bush by the front door. And as soon as I opened the door and walked in, I would not allow myself to think about that stuff anymore. I was home, I was present, I was with my family. You know, that stuff was there, this was now, this is home, this is family. You know, again, compartmentalizing. It became good at compartmentalizing. So he said, I'd get up the next morning, I'd shower, shave, I'd start to sort of, you know, begin to think about stuff. He says, I'd walk out the front door, put my car, I'd kind of pick all those problems up and, and you know, take them to the car and carry them to the office with me. He said, I had plenty of time to think about 
what I needed to do that day and back through the time. So there was only one problem with that practice. What happened? The push guy. The push guy. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. So the bush couldn't handle it. So, but you can always plan it in the bush, you know. Better than, better than exposing your family to it. Hmm. How many people have read Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning? Wonderful book. I highly recommend it. Not very long, um, but it's very profound. So Victor Frankl, if you don't know, was a Viennese psychiatrist who survived a Nazi concentration camp, a Jewish Jewish psychiatrist who survived a concentration camp in World War II. And from that experience, he used his training combined with his experiences in that camp, he developed a whole form of psychotherapy based on that. But most important to me, I think, is, is the, the, what he learned and shared with the world based on that experience. And he said that what that experience taught him was those captors who were able to survive that experience, the most important thing, he said that they could take everything away from us, which they did. That's what, that's what a totalitarian you know, uh, concentration camp is all about. It's about taking control away from you, from everything in your life. He said, but we realized, we discovered there was one thing they couldn't take away from us. Venture guesses what that was. Oh, I got it up there. Oh, whoops. <laughs> sometimes I use the PowerPoint, sometimes I don't get like, what's on the screen. Right. They could not take away how we how we responded and reacted. We always had within us the ability to control that. And I think that that's a very profound and important message that we have within us the ability to control how it is that we allow ourselves to respond and react day to day to the things that we have to uh, contend with. So the people that we work with in our program, I think what's most damaging and problematic is that many people, unfortunately, instead of developing that you know, capacity to compartmentalize and turn it off and shut it off on a regular basis, uh, reach a point where they begin to carry all that stuff, all those problems in their life, it's sort of a mental duffel bag over their shoulder they carry it around 24-7. And that really begins to wear down, you know, and that's what triggers things like an anxiety disorder and depression and so forth. Uh, you know, even the, the, the strongest of us the most resilient after a while would, would buckle under that. So one of the things, of course, that you know, we help people learn to do is to you know, get back that compartmentalization and look through a variety of different counseling resources. Um, somebody in the rooms said something about, and who, is the gentleman who said something about unrealistic expectations still in the room? I'm not, I'm not sure he is, okay. So, uh, I, I think this is, oops, yeah. However it is you define your client, whether you're in private practice or not, you still have a client. I think that this is a very important component of uh, this managing the stress, managing the unrealistic expectations. Because what has happened in the last 30, 40 years is a very profound change in the practice of law. And this is one of the most profound changes that has transpired. So 40 years ago, if you were practicing transactional law, how long did a client think it would expect it to take if they sent you a document to review and respond to? How long was it going to take to get that response? Two weeks. Right. Two weeks. Two weeks, Jones says, yeah. At least a week at a, at, a, at a bare minimum. It just wasn't technologically capable or possible to do it any faster than that. Well, today, that it can happen. How long? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, an hour, you know, I don't know how long it takes you to, you know. 
And unfortunately, those unrealistic expectations are rampant out there because of the fact that you have the capability to drop everything and deal with their problem instantly. There are many people out there who just assume you're going to do that unless you actively play a role in managing those expectations. You know, and that's, it's, it's really, it's, it's one of the biggest sources of client complaints against attorneys today. Is attorneys who did not do an effective job of communicating to their clients what the reasonable expectations for their particular case were. And, you know, it's, it, it's if you don't, it's boundless. Um, you know, and, and of course, related to this is the whole you know, the issue that I just spoke to a moment ago of the, the pace of practice. How many people have, have um, traveled at least once outside of this country? Yeah, usually it's everybody there at least once. Based on those experiences, would you say that our pace today is the norm for most of the planet? No. No. No, 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 far, far from. We're, you know, we, we, we move at a pace here that's probably, you know, the norm for like, at most 5% of human beings, even today, forget, you know, 100 years ago, today, this pace is not the norm. So, you know, if that's the case, then we have to make certain adjustments in our lives and the way we approach our work and and one of the challenges about this that I have seen over the years is I think that a lot of people begin to not only assume that there are certain expectations about the kind of pace that they will maintain and how they approach their personal life, but a lot of people take that same kind of pace and, and decide their, 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 I mean their professional life, but their personal life has to move with that same kind of intensity. And there, there's no, there's no, there's no work where that it's written out there. You know, we've just, as a society, abandoned a day of rest and reflection. Very, very few people in our society observe any kind of Sabbath uh, anymore. You know, which was just the norm. It's still the norm for much of the world today, and it was the norm in our society. If you go back, you know, 100 years ago, but we just given it up. So we just, you know, we just breeze through all seven days of the week with the same kind of pace and intensity. And, you know, we just can't keep that up. Um, do we have? Well, I won't go into my whole spiel about cell phone numbers, but. Uh, Oh, well, I'll, I'll do it quickly. So, <laughs> so I was in a room doing a talk, and, and, it was, and I was part of a program about technology, so I decided to ask, and it was a particularly young uh, audience of, of legal professionals, and I, and I asked them, and I said, okay, how many people in here have or, or regularly give their, their personal cell phone number out to clients? And I think about, I'm about a third or a half of that, that room raise their hands. So then I heard fall up, I said, okay, you know, this is a little bit more personal, you know, I understand if you don't answer this, but how many, how many of, of you folks uh, have experienced a, a life-threatening illness, either yourself or a friend or a close family, you know, family member, you know, maybe a quarter of the people who raise their hand and say, okay, now you, you folks who just raise your hand, how many of you have a personal cell phone number of a physician that was helping you manage that life-threatening <laughs> illness. And almost every single hand in the room went down. <laughs> but the lawyers, you know, feel that they have an obligation to do it anyway. You know, <clears throat> what were futurists saying is going to be the biggest challenge for us, though that's made it to the turn of the millennium? Anybody remember? Yes, sir. Too much leisure time, thank you. Exactly. The average work week is supposed to shrink to 25 hours. 
because of all the amazing technology and productivity tools that we're going to have available to us. Well, we have them. How many people are getting away with working 25 hours? So anyway, um, we really weren't designed to move at this kind of pace and intensity. So, you know, today I think it requires giving some thought and attention to actually creating spaces and places and moments in our lives when we can slow down to what I would posit as a more natural pace and intensity. Yes, sir? Maybe it's self-selected because the Bay Area is probably the number one uh, tenth place in the world. And maybe New York, Israel, or, you know, are, are close. Right. But you just walk to Buffalo, Nevada, or uh, Oregon, and the pace is so much slower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people that I think will pace. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, I've talked with a telephone the lawyers for years and years and years calling to complain about the, the horrible uh, experiences of trying to, uh, many of those, most of those calls came out of the LA Basin, actually, and what it was like to try to practice, uh, particularly litigation in a place like that, where, where you had to literally hop from courthouse to courthouse to courthouse, you know, and, and you, you know, they might be like 70 miles apart in three hours, you know, anyway. And I'd say in those conversations, did you, you know, have you always lived there? Where else, you know, where'd you grow up? Where are you from? Can you go back there? <laughs> you know, because, you know, we talk about the, so often about the absence of civility in the profession today. Well, why is that? Well, if you talk to people who practiced in smaller communities 50 years ago, you know, where there were maybe 100 lawyers in town, there was no incivility, never. You would never treat another legal professional like that because you were going to, you know, see them at, you know, the country club or, you know, some social function or, frankly, probably oppose them in another matter later on. You practice in a place like the L.A. Basin, you can do whatever you want to or, you know, or think you, you, you should be doing to the opposing counsel because you're never going to see them again. That just that that to me is 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 the biggest drawback to to practice of law today. You know, and if, if it were possible for everybody to be practicing in a setting where you know there were only other other practitioners around, everybody would be a lot more comfortable in practice of law. No question of that. So, any 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 questions or thoughts? Or does anybody just want to get on the boat before I get switched out there? Thank you for spending this time. I appreciate it.